This is video 9 of the Mindfulness-Based Ecotherapy Program Facilitator Certification Training. Video 9 covers Session 6 of the Mindfulness-Based Ecotherapy Program. Session 6 is Centering. You may recall that in the entire program there are 12 sessions and each session covers one skill of Mindfulness-Based Ecotherapy. There are six mindful skills and six ecotherapy skills. Session six covers the last of the mindful skills, and that is the art of centering. Centering yourself is allowing yourself to get in touch with and be open to your true self. It's allowing yourself to realize that you're perfect just as you are, even with your imperfections, because those feelings and desires are also a part of who you really are. If you accept your imperfections and integrate them into your way of thinking and feeling about yourself, you'll obtain peace of mind and you'll be centered. Preparation for facilitating session six is of course, read all the course materials in the next lesson, review the exercises that are presented in the next lesson and view all the videos that accompany the exercises in the lesson. Try all the activities at least once yourself. Then practice, of course, presenting the materials at least one time so that you have a good idea of how long it will take you and adjust by adding or leaving out materials as you need to, but don't cut key concepts or priority one exercises. The key concepts for session six are centering, the ideal self, the perceived self, acceptance versus change, your centering tree, and the tree of life meditation. Secondary concepts, and again, secondary concepts are those that if you don't have time, you can cut them, but leave them if you can. The tree at the center, personal truths, and your own core values. The introduction for this session, I like to use as an icebreaker is the concept of centering. We define it a little differently than you may have heard it in other materials, but uh, the idea of centering in mindfulness-based ecotherapy is simply to allow yourself to get in touch with and to be open to your true self. You can link the concept of experiential avoidance to centering by noting that if you're trying to avoid experiences, you're trying to avoid certain parts of your true self. And no matter where you go, you can't run away from your true self. By learning to center, you're able to allow yourself to experience the fullness of the being that is your true self. After you've completed the icebreaker, then go on to address the homework and answer any questions your students might have had about the materials. Session 6.0 is called Finding Your Center. So why is centering important? Cresswell and Lindsay in 2014 found that mindful centering helps people make less stressful assumptions and appraisals about life situations and helps them to reduce stress reactivity responses. Centering refers to the process of emptying your mind of any concerns about past problems or future worries. In mindfulness-based ecotherapy, centering is a way of preparing yourself for doing deeper meditative work, which in turn leads you to being able to connect to your true self. In this session, we learn a few centering techniques, and then these skills lay the groundwork for connecting, which will be covered in session seven. We're going to focus specifically on one method of centering using the tree of life meditation. Section 6.1 is called, Who Are You? This discusses the idea of the ideal self versus the perceived self, and that comes from Carl Rogers. You might ask the students to describe how far apart the two are for them. And of course, the closer together your ideal self and your perceived self are, the less problems you have. But the further apart those two get, the more problems you tend to create for yourself because the perceived self is saying, why can't I be like that ideal self over there? So mindfulness-based ecotherapy has one of two goals, either to move the ideal self closer to the perceived self or to move the perceived self closer to the ideal self. In reality, most people meet in the middle somewhere. So what that means is 
they change their ideal self a little bit to accommodate the perceived self, or vice versa. When I do this, I ask students to describe how far apart the two are for them, and they don't have to go into personal details if they don't want to, but just a general description. You could then allow them to follow up by asking what would move each person's ideal self and perceived self closer together. And of course, the ideal self that Carl Rogers talks about is what we refer to as the true self in mindfulness-based ecotherapy. Once you've had that discussion, you can move on to the dialectic of acceptance versus change. Link that to the idea that we can only change ourselves, we can't change others. We can ask others to change, but if they refuse to do so, then we have to accept that it's beyond our capacity to change the other person. Either that, or we have to accept that it's not a relationship that we need to be in for our own mental health. Sometimes when I discuss this idea, there are students who insist on trying to get other people to change. In such a case, it's usually because the student is using the idea of forcing others to change as a defense mechanism to avoid the responsibility of changing themselves. Either that, or they're clinging to a relationship that they probably shouldn't be in in the first place. In extreme cases, such as abusive relationships, acceptance doesn't mean accepting the abuse. It means accepting that this is a relationship that must end in order to avoid being hurt any further. The ultimate in acceptance is to be able to accept one's perceived self as easily and as readily as one can accept their ideal self. When the two are one and the same, then the ultimate acceptance has been achieved. The irony here is that the only way you can move closer to your ideal self is to first accept your perceived self as it is, warts and all. Section 6.2 is Centering with Centre Expressive Arts. For those of you who are trained in the old program, you may recognize that this is a new exercise here. So let's go over this in a little more detail since it's new to the program. The centering exercises uses Santre Expressive Arts Therapy, which allows you to center by getting in touch with both the conscious and the unconscious aspects of your true self. The unconscious manifestation of your true self will occur through the process of natural attraction. The conscious manifestation of your true self will manifest through expressive arts. And we're going to explain in a little more detail what all of that means in just a moment. So hang on. <laughs> this means that in mindfulness-based egotherapy, centering means becoming aware of these unconscious manifestations of your true self so that they can be brought into your conscious awareness. When we talk about natural attraction, what natural attraction is, is just going out into nature. And as you observe things, there are certain things that you want to explore more of. You want to go see what's up with that. Say you might be attracted to feathers, so you see a feather on the ground, you're naturally going to want to go and explore that some more. Or if you like flowers, you see a flower on a bush, you might want to go explore that some more. The idea behind that is that different people are naturally attracted to different objects in nature. And we're using that natural attraction to lead them to be able to make something, a piece of artwork, using Santre Expressive Arts. If you've never experienced Santre Expressive Arts therapy before, then let's review that briefly for those with no experience. Now, before we do that, I will say that in this exercise, in this session, we use a modified form of the Santre Expressive Arts therapy. And the modified form that we use doesn't actually use a Santre. But we use the term just because people who have been trained in Santre will be familiar with what we're trying to, do, to achieve here. So let's talk about first what traditional Santre therapy looks like. If you went to a Santre therapist, then they would have an actual Santre in their office. And shelf upon shelf of little figurines. These figurines could be fairies, animals toy soldiers, or just abstract objects. The idea behind Santre therapy is a person takes a basket and goes around the shelf after coming up with a problem that they want to work on in the Santre. And they select objects that just seem to call to them to create scene in the Santre. 
So first they select a problem that they want to work on or a question that they want to ask, and then they meditate on it for a little while, centering and, and thinking about the problem. And then they get up and take their basket and go pick figurines to create a scene based on that theme. Once they've gotten those figurines, then they go into the sand tray and create a scene based on what the question was that they were asking. Then the therapist and the person who created the scene interpret it together. Good sand tray therapists don't try to assign any meaning to the figures and to the scene that the patient doesn't want to talk about. In other words, the patient does the interpreting. The therapist is just there to guide them. So keep that in mind as we do our modified version of Santre Expressive Arts. To participate in the, out, the exercise that we use, what we do is we have people go out into the woods and just pick things that they're naturally attracted to. Sticks, rocks, feathers, whatever they find in nature to create their scene with. So you'll need baskets for all your participants or bags or something for them to put all these objects in. And you'll also need to make sure that there are no rules about picking flowers or disturbing the flora and fauna of the site that you're using. If that's the case, then you might need to bring your own natural objects and you can just have them pick from those. So they go out after centering themselves with a little brief meditation, they go out and pick up those objects based on their natural attractions. And then they're going to come back and sit on the ground and create a scene using those objects. So there are some steps outlined in the chapter, and I'm going to read these directly from the book. How do you consciously become aware of the unconscious? In other words, we're trying to tap into those unconscious parts of the true self. One way to do this is through the Santre Expressive Art exercise that we're talking about. And there are a couple of citations to support this. Degas White in 2018 and Garrett in 2014. Those citations are in the book, so you can read them in the next lesson. So the steps are, number one, you think about your own true self. Who are you? Why are you, you? What do you want in life? What do you want to do in life? If you could sum up your existence in a sentence or two, what would that be? Now, you might read these questions to your students. If they've done the homework, they've already read them, but just refresh their memory. Maybe have them do a brief centering exercise and then go on to step two, which is to go out into nature, collect some objects with which to create a scene in the sand tray or on the ground at a place designated by the facilitator of your group. These should be natural objects, things like rocks, flowers, twigs, feathers, that sort of thing. And then they use those materials. They can put them in a bag, a basket, or a bucket. And when you select the materials, have them rely on the principle of natural attraction. Don't put too much conscious thought into making the selections. Just allow the objects themselves to speak to them. They choose the objects they're naturally attracted to without trying to fit them into some preconceived plan for the finished product. Just let them call out to them on their own. And then they gather their materials until they feel like they're done. Now, I would make a note here. The way we usually do this with the uh, program is to have a spot on the ground for the students to create their piece of art. And we have them pick up objects in nature, seashells, twigs, all those things that we've talked about. Two possible potential problems there. If you have a site like a national park or something where you're doing your exercises, they may not be allowed to use certain natural objects like picking flowers or pulling plants out of the ground or disturbing rocks. In that case, you can always provide them with natural materials. Find some feathers somewhere, find some rocks somewhere, find some sticks, twigs, leaves, seashells, whatever you can think of, and have them in a box for them to draw on. The second thing is if you're worried about putting things on the ground and disturbing the environment there, in other words, creating art scenes on the ground, then you can also actually use the real sand trays. Just get a sand tray to use. And you can do that for each participant. Uh, one very cheap, uh, one very inexpensive way to do that is to just buy these Tupperware containers that are about 12 by 18 inches that you can find in most, um, most convenience stores or most uh, department stores. And then fill them with play sand to about an inch or two. 
and bags of play sand are anywhere from five to ten bucks. So they're not very expensive at all. So you can have sand trays for everybody if you absolutely have to do that. And that will avoid the problem of putting the things on the ground. So the next thing is to have your students hold in mind the answers to the questions that they answered in step one. Who am I? Where am I going? That sort of thing. And then complete the art piece on the ground or in the sand tray. Remember that the goal of the piece is to portray your innermost self using natural elements that you've gathered. One thing is also, if, if you're using natural objects like feathers, leaves, seashells, stones, twigs, it might not be such an issue to leave those on the ground as a lot of that is biodegradable and it will go away naturally over time. Or you can just have your students clean it up after it's over with. I do uh, allow them, I usually don't allow my students to carry their cell phones with them to sessions just uh, because they're usually a distraction. But in sessions like this where we're creating something like a piece of art, I'll let them take pictures of it. So you can create your own policy for that. But I do find that a lot of people are more willing to clean up their expressive art piece if they're allowed to take a picture of it. Once you've completed your piece, you meditate on it for a moment or two, then answer these questions. These questions are actually going to be in the exercise. So we're not going to go over the questions here because this is the outline. But when you get to the lesson materials for session six, there will be a video explaining the questions. The next section is section 6.3, and this is another new exercise. The uh, older version of the program had the birth tree exercise here, and it was based on uh, Celtic tree folklore. Uh, the problem with that is, of course, that the trees involved in the Celtic tree folklore only grow in the British Isles. So if you're not in the British Isles, there was no birth tree nearby to complete the exercise with. So we changed this to a centering tree exercise. The basic principle of this is what sort of tree would you be if you were a tree? For example, would you be an oak that firmly stands its ground? Or would you be a willow that remains rooted by bending and flowing with the storm? Would you shed your leaves in the winter and hibernate? Or would you be an evergreen year-round, bringing life and energy to your leaf-shedding friends? So for this centering tree exercise, we'll be identifying the characteristics of trees and comparing them to the characteristics of humans. We'll be comparing the characteristics of your favorite tree to characteristics you possess in yourself. And then in this way, we'll be using trees as a metaphor to center ourselves. The way I approach this with students is to have them all Choose a tree that grows locally, wherever they are. It doesn't have to be a tree, it can be a plant, just so it's some growing thing that they can use for this exercise. And then, once they have selected their favorite tree, I ask them to express how is that tree like you, how is that tree different from you. Based on the characteristics of the tree, is it strong, is it flexible, is it bare fruit, is it leaf shedding, all of those things. And it helps just to have the students list the reason that they chose that tree and what characteristics it has and how that tree might be similar or different to them. We need to do that before we go on to the next section. The next section is 6.4, the Tree of Life Meditation. That Tree of Life Meditation is included in the materials for the next lesson. There's an actual facilitated recording for the meditation. You can choose that to use with your students or you can create a script of your own. So the students have to select a tree in 6.3, the centering tree exercise, before they can go on to the tree of life meditation. Because the tree of life meditation, they will be focusing on the tree that they selected during the meditation. Then section 6.4 also includes an exercise called Reflections on the Tree of Life Meditation. And there's a video in the session 6 materials in the next lesson that will explain how to complete that activity with your students. Session 6.5 is getting to know your tree. The exercise in this section helps with centering by spending time with a tree or another plant in nature. You can have your students each select a tree or other plant with which to spend a few minutes. Now, unless you're extremely fortunate, 
the location that you're using for the mindfulness-based ecotherapy program is probably not going to have everyone's centering tree there. So you won't be able to necessarily allow them to spend a few minutes with their own centering tree. So this plant doesn't have to be a centering tree. That's uh, any, any plant or tree that happens to be available in the area. I've had people who do the program in the desert and they've had people select cactuses, that sort of thing. The idea here is for them to experience centering by exploring the plant with all of their senses in the present moment. And by focusing on their senses, they're leaving thinking mode and entering into sensing mode. And you probably recall by now that that means that when they're in sensing mode, they're leaving doing mode and entering into being mode. Centering is ultimately being in the moment with their own true selves. So by coming into the present moment, they're more open to receiving their true selves. After letting your class spend some time exploring a tree or other plant with all of their senses, ask them what the experience was like. Do they feel calmer and more centered? And some people might say no. The idea there is to facilitate a discussion on why they had the response that they had. There's an optional activity here in this section called a year with your tree. And since it's a year, obviously you can't do it within the context of the mindfulness-based ecotherapy program, which is only 12 weeks. So because this activity takes an entire year, it's outside of the scope of a 12-week mindfulness-based ecotherapy seminar. So you may have your students choose to do this on their own if they wish. And once they found their centering tree, they develop a deeper relationship with it. The best way to do this is to befriend the tree for at least a year. By doing that, you've observed and described your tree in all seasons. You'll have experienced all of its manifestations throughout the entire year. If your students choose to do this, they may wish to keep a centering tree journal. They can write any of their observations down about the tree. They can also use it to record any tree lore or songs or poetry about their tree or any healing properties that the tree might have, or any magical properties that the tree might have. If their tree bears leaves, they could press them in the journal and keep the leaves as a memento. They could even do one for each season. They can also take photographs of the tree from time to time and watch it as it grows. And in that case, they might wish to make an online journal about their tree. Notice that from time to time, trees shed their leaves branches fall off. New growths of leaves or flowers or fruit begin. Trees are always changing, in other words. They're a reminder that we are always changing and growing too. Just because on occasion our own leaves fall off and our own branches may need an occasional pruning, that doesn't mean that we're bad trees or bad people. As you and your tree change together, it can help you to find your own roots, your own branches, and your own center. Session 6.6 .6 is the tree at the center. I usually like to have at least one student read the material in this section out loud, or you can also read it aloud to the students. When you're doing this, I recommend that you read it aloud to yourself. After doing so, ask your students to reflect on their own sense of oneness with all of life. Did the material in this section help them to feel more at peace with all of existence? If so, why? And if not, what would it take to help them to center and connect with all life? The final section in session six is 6.7, Lessons from the Tree of Life. In this final section for session six, trees are used as a metaphor for being centered. Trees are rooted in the ground while reaching for the stars. So ask your students how they can learn from the trees how to center themselves in their own daily lives. That's it for video nine, which covers the session six materials. Coming up next, we're going to go into the first of the ecotherapy skills in the program. That is session seven, connecting.